SJC 12302, Commonwealth VP J. Duarte. Good morning, may it please the court, uh, attorney one second, Afton one Templin second, on behalf one second, of the defendants. One second, one second, one second. Restrain your enthusiasm until we can get the clock started. All right, now. All right. Good morning, may it please the court, <coughs> attorney Afton Templin on behalf of the appellant Peter Duart in this case. An ordinary fallible attorney would meet their ethical obligation of full and fair disclosure to their client. They would not withhold material facts. Attorneys have a fiduciary relationship to their client. It is not where we stand as parents pat try to decide what information they should know and what information we can withhold from them. The rules of professional conduct, as well as the cases elaborating what constitutes effective assistance of counsel, are quite clear. It is the attorney's obligation to explain facts and circumstances to their client to enable them to make an informed decision. Certainly in circumstances such as this, where it is the defendant's personal right to his constitutional right to a jury trial that he is waiving. This is not a strategic decision that counsel makes in consultation with his client. This is the defendant's right to waive personally. And as the motion judge found, trial counsel knew the judge's son was a prosecutor. Clearly, the judge knew that fact. The defendant did not, and that is fundamentally unfair. Would this have been a necessary disclosure, irrespective of whether this was a jury trial waiver? I'm sorry. I missed the even if, that. even <coughs> if it was, would the client, would the lawyer have had the responsibility to talk with the client about this matter? If it was just a jury trial? If it was just a jury trial, or if it was just in connection with the trial? I yeah, would suggest there should be disclosure, yes. Is it come to the same impact? No. If it was a jury trial, I think, again, counsel has the obligation to disclose the relevant facts that are in their possession to the client, to say, by the way, this judge's son is a prosecutor, I want to make you aware of that. If the client then says, oh, I want him to recuse himself, that becomes a strategic decision they have in consultation. Well, let me ask you, and maybe I have unbundling on my mind from the DP, from the, DPU. From the DPU, DPU <laughs> case. I'm not going to go to that Right, part. thank you. If, 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 we un <laughs> if we unbundled, so if the... Do you quibble with the judge's decision where the judge looked at our ethical rules and said he did not have that responsibility? The obligation to sue a spawn to disqualify himself, yes. Right. Yes. And, and I know what you're, you're saying, that, that the, the trial attorney, because he knew, that carried on. But is there any nexus between what the judge has to do and the defendant, defense attorney's uh, responsibility? I don't think there's a nexus so much. I think... In, in this case, it's twofold. Number one, I think the judge should have at least disclosed. And I think the, um, the decision from the Judicial Ethics Committee, it does say there are circumstances you need to be aware in which you might need to at least <coughs> disclose, if not recuse yourself. So I think the judge should have an obligation in a jury way of trial to say, are you aware my son's a prosecutor in the office? That's the obligation to do that? You think the judge To disclose? Has, the judge I think did? in a jury way of trial, I do think so. And I think, uh, yeah, I, because again, it's- Notwithstanding the ethical uh, the rule talks about per se disqualification. It, it does not say there is no per se requirement to disclose. It does say you need to be aware of unique circumstances in which the second prong of Lena might come into play. And again, where it's you know, the right to a jury trial, if in a, in a, when they're impaneling a jury, the question is to the, to the pool, do any of you know me? Do any of you know the witnesses? Do you know the attorneys? Raise your hand, let's talk about it. That's all a disclosure would do, is put it on the record, everyone's aware, let's talk about it. And I think that's different than a requiring a per se disqualification. So yes, I do think the judge should at least disclose. But does this mean, say the son was working as an ADA in a different... Um, different, different county. Right. No. <laughs> no. No No reason to disclose? I don't believe so, no. Because if, if there is that close familiar relationship in the prosecuting district attorney's office, that's very different than a child working in another county because there's no cross-pollination, as it were. The other DA's office is not involved in the case at all. But in this case, the son was not involved in the case at all. He was not, all. but again, it, it is the office. It, and I have to say, when I, you know, people ask what case they have before this court, and I tell them the eyebrow goes up, like, what? <laughs> the son's a DA in that office? It, it's something that at least gives people pause. And I think when it does have that sense of an objective observer kind of going, you know, the head nod, that should at least be disclosed. Doesn't mean it's going to lead to per se disqualification, but at least disclose it so that the defendant is aware so, of all the facts and circumstances. So, so, so if, if you win and, and we decide that it was ineffective assistance, how do we articulate the duty to a lawyer other than this case? 
what's the lawyer supposed to do as far as <coughs> they're going to appear in front of Gaziano, who's a trial judge? Now they're going to have to look at, well, who does he know? Who is he related to? I, I, I'm not going so far as to say that trial counsel has an obligation to investigate the judge. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Where, where counsel is in possession of facts about the tribunal, under the rules of professional conduct, they're obligated to make a full and fair disclosure. Okay? If, it's similar to if you're advising a client in regards to, you know, there's a motion to eliminate an objection to a, a jury instruction. <clears throat> you explain all the facts and circumstances. You have a conversation. If it's a strategic decision the counsel can make, if it's a personal decision to change a guilty plea, to testify, to waive a jury trial, the defendant is the one who makes that choice. So if this court were to make a pronouncement, and, and again, this would apply to all cases where individuals are entitled to the representation of counsel. SORB, STP, termination of parental rights, Rogers, criminal cases and guardianships in some circumstances. That counsel has an obligation. If you are aware of information that is material to a decision that your client has to make, disclose that information. Be the advisor, be the consultant. So, so what's the, <clears throat> what do we say if, if we agree with you that the attorney should have disclosed? What's the second part of the analysis which requires you to show? The prejudice? Right. The cases, um, ineffective assistance cases that look at the prejudice prong, it's, it's kind of a result-oriented case. So in, for example, the, the cases have gone to trial was the defendant deprived of an otherwise available substantial defense? If it was a change of plea, would the client not have pled had he known this? Um, in SORB cases, it's would the classification have been different? It's, it's the result, it's the so what, <laughs> as it were. In this case, the so what is, number one, the defendant testified that had I known, I would not have waived my right to a jury trial. I would have pushed this change of venue issue. So there's prejudice right there, number one. Number two, in, in the broader scheme of things, as an attorney, it is our ethical obligation to stand as a fiduciary and to provide our clients with all the information they need. So the prejudice is if you as an attorney are not going to divulge information to your client, you're going to decide what my client needs to know, that's prejudice right there. Not complying with the rules of professional responsibility, that's prejudice right there. It's, it's somewhat akin to a structural error that just, that cannot be. <laughs> that attorney can decide what I want to tell my client. In this case, didn't the attorney say that he thought, he, he thought that the defendant knew about he, the... He was um, less than clear <laughs> on that particular part of it. He did say, I, I knew my client knew the judge's son, right. the football relationship. Um, but there's nowhere in the record where the uh, trial counsel, to my recollection, where trial counsel says, I know he knew the judge's son was a prosecutor I I know because... He knew. But I thought it, I thought he knew. So it wasn't a it, it, not even to he, that he level. But on purpose, though, mm -hmm. it's not as if he said, "I'm going to keep this from uh, the defendant so that he goes through with this jury waive trial." He did. My recollection, he did testify that it would, you know, perhaps be important for the client to be aware of that, um, and he was quite clear that he knew that. Um, and and he it, knew that the 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 uh, that Ma Moriarty was Judge Moriarty's son. Clearly, yes. Um, the trial counsel knew that, and the motion judge found the defendant knew that as well. The, the judge, judge I'm sorry. That, Go that's ahead. What, that's, what, that's what Judge Healy found. Judge Healy found that at least Mr. Segadelli knew, um, the <coughs> defendant knew that Robert Moriarty was the son, but also yes. Mr. Segadelli, of course, knew that he was an, an ADA. Yes. Yeah. But, but there was no finding that, that the defendant, the defendant knew. knew. Right. So it was that, that two parts of it that he knew was his son, but he didn't know his son was a prosecutor. Right. Yeah. Um, so my thought on it, you know, Issuing a ruling that attorneys have an obligation to disclose facts in their possession that are relevant and material to their client's decision to waive a jury trial right to change a plea to guilty or to testify, that really shouldn't be anything new. That's nothing earth shaking. It is if you have facts in your possession, disclose them to your client. It, it's, it's somewhat counterpart to the attorney's obligation to investigate the facts and circumstances. An example for immigration consequences. We have an obligation to inquire of our client to advise them properly. What's your immigration status? If attorneys have an obligation to inquire and to investigate, they have the, the flip side. They have an obligation to disclose when they have information the client does not. What, what do we do with Judge Healy's finding that the prejudice uh, prong was not met? He looked at the trial transcript. He wasn't deprived of, of a substantial ground of defense. I know you argued it was structural error of some sort, but... It's, 
but the prejudice is not what happened during the trial. The prejudice is the attorney withheld information from his client. He did not fulfill his obligation. That's the prejudice. It's, it's not that everything go okay after. <laughs> it's when he made that decision to waive his constitutional right to a jury trial. Did he have all the facts and circumstances, all the information that the other two players in the courtroom did have, and he did not? Well, would you have, would you have the obligation to show that it would have been different if he had a jury trial? In this case, we do. The defendant quite clearly said, if I had known, I would not have gone no, no, jury no. I mean, but generally. On, on prejudice, would you have an obligation to show that it would have been different if he had a jury trial? That the decision would have been different. Right. That's the what outcome I'm focusing. Would have been not, the, not the outcome of the trial, no, but no, the, outcome the outcome of that decision. No, yes. no. The outcome of the trial, would is that the proper measure of prejudice? Or is I, it? Not in this circumstance, no. You don't think no. so? No. Um, whether it altered out in the end <laughs> is not the point. The point is when the client made the decision <clears throat> to waive his right, did he, was that an informed decision? And to be informed, you have to know all the facts and circumstances. So that is the hub of the prejudice right there, is when he made that decision to waive his right, his personal fundamental decision. Was well, he well aware to of use it? your analogy to uh, immigration cases, I mean, we do require the defendant before he gets a new trial to show that there are objective facts. I mean, he just can't say, uh, I would have mm -hmm. done it differently. I mean, we look at the, the details of the case. Yes. I mean, yes. yeah, we look at it mm -hmm. and we, we see, well, would he really have done that? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering why you say we shouldn't do that in this case. Because I think in regards to taking a plea that has immigration consequences, to show that you know, if, if I had known I would have had these consequences, I wouldn't have taken that deal with Crest for a different one. This is a very insular decision. This is a one-time one -time thing. You waive your right to a jury trial or not. And, and the hub of the claim is that he, counsel shouldn't be able to withhold information from him when he makes that uh, well, decision. Well, I get so that th part, but I, I think that, that you've made your point quite clearly. What, what I'm trying to understand is what do we do with that? How, how do we weigh the fact that the lawyer didn't tell him? I think that's, th that's the question. I think the way that you weigh it is you look at the attorney-client relationship. The attorney has an obligation to disclose he didn't. The client says, if I had known that, I wouldn't have changed my plea. I mean, I wouldn't have waived my right to a jury trial. Okay, and so I go back to my question analogizing this to the immigration consequences cases. I mean, we don't just accept the defendant's um, well, I think, and I'm sorry, statement we, that, mm -hmm. yeah, if I, if I had known about the immigration consequences, I wouldn't have pleaded. We go further than that. Well, so why isn't this case different? Because here, the defendant did testify to that point, that if I had known, I wouldn't have waived. And the motion judge did not discredit him in that regard. But he didn't all. make a finding, did he? He did not. He did, he, and he did not discredit the defendant in other circumstances, when he said, you know, any um, any doubts I might have that the defendant knew about this, the son being a prosecutor or not, it's not enough for me to say he didn't. So he didn't come out and say I find him just I discredit him across the board. He did not do that. Um, and I was just where he did not discredit the defendant's testimony and affidavit that had I known I would not have waived. But, but isn't it a more complicated finding than simply the defendant said he wouldn't, in the sense that he didn't have great options here. Uh, Judge had already said the trial is going to be held in Martha's Vineyard. Well, not exactly. <laughs> what he unless, said is there unless, we have a, unless we have a problem getting a jury. Yes, and I'll reconsider. Uh, defense counsel was uncomfortable with that. Uh, judge Moriarty is a widely admired judge and apparently was thought to be one by the defense counsel who would be fair. Mm -hmm. don't, we, don't we have to, do, wouldn't we have to remand? to get a finding as to whether or not there was prejudice here? Or, or can you say we just accept his statement, I would have done something differently? I think if this court requires this finding or statement that I would have done it differently. Um, unfortunately, Justice Healy is also retired, so I go back for a different judge as well. But I think where the record is clear that the defendant has said, if I'd known, I wouldn't have. And I think it's a reasonable inference that for a defendant to have the information of, of this magnitude, he wouldn't have just said, oh, okay, that's fine, let's go forward with it. <laughs> and where they had already um, talked about some of the challenges, it's not that this would have been, you know, 
manna from heaven. Th th this information would have changed everything as far as this, how this case came up. But the point is that he was entitled to at least know and to be able to include that fact in his calculus about where he would fare better. It's, but what do we do? Jury trials. Mm -hmm. We ask prospective jurors, uh, you, you know, are you related to anybody in the DA's office? It's a routine question. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, it's not disqualifying. No, it's not. You come up and you talk uh, about it. Yeah. But if we have somebody in which the defense defendant comes back later and says, you know, juror number four didn't tell us that his brother or his son was actually in the DA's office, and if I had known that, I would have struck him. And is there an analogy to that circumstance? If we, do we open, once we, if we do this, do we have to then say that person gets a new trial too? I don't think so. I think. Um the difference between going jury waiting <coughs> with the jury is that you know there's there's more than one juror. Obviously, it's not one person. And I think where the jury impanelment process involves defense counsel, prosecutor, judge, and the defendant all working in tandem. And in some cases, the defendant takes a back seat in that process, and the, and the trial counsel really is the one that can make the decisions about how this jury is going to play out. But where the where the cases and the rules of professional conduct are quite clear, that there are three circumstances. That is the defendant's choice and the defendant's choice alone what to do. That puts on a different footing than impaling a jury. And again, I was just, even in that circumstance, you call the juror up, defense counsel can ask questions, prosecutor can ask questions, there can be objections, there's a process to kind of weed that out. <coughs> that doesn't happen in this circumstance. This is a one and done. So this is, yeah, I'm looking at Judge um, Healy's findings and he says, his advice to the defendant regarding a jury way of trial was well within the range of reasonable, competent representation. Isn't that the first prong? I would suggest no, because it wasn't advice. You don't, the, 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 the circumstances with the defendant changing his, waiving his right to a jury trial, is, it's not, you, the jury, the, the lawyer can't say to him, oh, I think you should, I think you shouldn't. It is, here's the pros, here's the cons, you have to choose. But you're saying so, it was ineffective assistance of counsel. To not so tell him, to, to not tell him. Just the not telling. Yeah. There may have been other things he knew that he didn't tell him about Judge Moriarty, too. There may be, but certainly when my client found but this doesn't it come into the basis? But doesn't it come into the rubric of what he knew? He says, based on his professional experience, Mr. Sigadelli was confident Judge Moriarty would be fair and impartial in a jury way of trial. And he discussed with the defendant the pros and cons of having a jury waived trial with Judge Moriarty. With one big exception. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> one big how exception. big it was yeah. is a question uh, I suppose we have to think about. But um, on the basis of competent advice from his attorney, the defendant made his own tactical decision to waive the right to a jury trial. I would suggest competent but incomplete. And if attorneys have this obligation of full and fair disclosure, that has to mean everything. Oh, everything. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Ms. Sweeney, good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, Elizabeth Sweeney on behalf of the Commonwealth. There's no conflict of interest in this case. The judge was not required to recuse himself or inform the defendant that his son was a district court prosecutor, and counsel was not required to inform the defendant that the judge's son was also a district court prosecutor. The, defense, the prosecutor in this case, Rob Moriarty, did not handle any cases on Martha's Vineyard. He never appeared before his father. He was a line district court prosecutor on Nantucket, Nantucket District Court, in Orleans District Court, Falmouth District Court, and Barnstable. But the defendant didn't know these things. The defendant didn't know those things. However, it's not a conflict. If it's not a question of it being a conflict. It's a question of whether or not the defendant, I think that the, the defendant's argument is basically, was there an obligation on the part of counsel to disclose this to the client so that the client could know this when making the decision. And there would be an obligation if there was a conflict. If we review the cases that have addressed conflict of interest, Lena, So you're saying it's only when there's a conflict? Only when there's... When that that the, the, the defense lawyer has an obligation to disclose that the information that he knows? Yes, that's the issue that we're addressing. And only when there's a conflict? We're, Looking at this issue in a vacuum, the issue is whether when Robert Moriarty was a prosecutor in my office, if there's a conflict when his father was the judge on this case. That is the crux of what we're looking at today. That, that, that's, sure. not sure where, that's not where um, the defendant's coming from, though. Where, where the def I mean, it's the first part of the brief. But what the defendant is saying is that 
that there's very few things more fundamental, more important than a right to a jury trial. We put our faith and our fate in the jury. And if there was an obligation for the trial attorney to disclose uh, the relationship between uh, him and his son, who is a prosecutor in the same office, that you, when you're showing that you gave up and otherwise substantial grounds for defense, it's not whether the verdict would have been different or not, because the core of what we're analyzing here is the defendant giving up that right to have his guilt adjudicated by a jury, to give up that opportunity to have his faith and his fate determined by a jury. That's, that's what she's arguing. Exactly, and if we're going to take your statement and review that under Strickland, Safarian, whether or not Drew Segadelli was ineffective in not disclosing this information, which, by the way, my office has been forthright, forthcoming with the fact that Robert Moriarty was involved in, employed in our office during that time period. If we're gonna apply Strickland, Safarian to that statement, there was no inattentive action. There was no incompetency because if you look at the Code of Judicial Conduct, the CJE opinion that the judge relied on, the United States Supreme Court opinion, and the litany of cases that I cited in my brief, there was no issue with the fact that he was on another island, on another, in another county. I'm just gonna concede for the purpose of this discussion that, is, that that's right. Okay. Okay, but a lot of things go into a decision to go jury waived. Clearly, the respect that uh, Judge Moriarty had with this um, attorney and, and with the bar was, was part of it, but maybe this relationship was part of it. So should the second prong of Severian uh, simply be whether the verdict would have been different? No, it, we should look at the issue of second prong, which is prejudice, and the defendant's educated and informed decision after consulting with his attorney and the jury trial waiver and the transcript for the motion for new trial and the motion for new trial opinion address that issue. And looking at this set of facts where the defendant was on an island of 10 to 15,000 people and accused of, charged with rape subsequent offense on a mentally handicapped individual. And he, the victim in this case, had an IQ of 58 I suggest that he made an informed decision to go jury way before Judge Moriarty based on viewing this case in the specific circumstances of being on an island in a subsequent but charge isn't, of But isn't that an argument as to prejudice, that even if he had known this, he would have made the same decision as opposed to, I mean, the concern I have is that in every jury trial, we ask, do you, we ask the jurors, do you know, do you, are you related to anybody in the DA's office? If the answer is yes, we bring them to sidebar and we see whether the person could be fair. And if we, and we can, the person could be fair. And, but then the defense counsel would say, I may not move to strike for cause, but I'm gonna exercise a peremptory because my client may have a concern about having my guilt or innocence decided by somebody who has a relative in the DA's office. And here there's only one fact finder and he didn't have, that question was not, he, didn't, he didn't, did not, not know the answer to that question. I mean, that's the concern. However, if you're gonna review the standard that Judge Rehnquist used in the Microsoft case, which uh, it, is- But the issue is not whether, the issue to me is not whether I'm prepared to accept that Judge Moriarty had no obligation to recuse himself, and I'm prepared to accept that Judge Moriarty was entirely fair and impartial in adjudicating the case. That, for me, is not my concern, frankly. My concern is whether or not the defendant had an informed and intelligent, up, uh, made an informed and intelligent decision whether to choose to say, I will go with him as a fact finder. The defendant did have an informed decision. Um, as the record reflects, he consulted with his attorney as to their decision why to go before Judge Moriarty. Um, Robert Moriarty and Drew Segadelli testified at the motion of new trial hearing. You have that transcript. Drew Segadelli said that based on his review of the case, 
his opinion, he wanted to go, go before Judge Murray based on the fact that the case was going to stay on the island. So with that factor, the change of venue motion being denied, um, I suggest to this court that it was a reasonable, well-educated opinion. And if I'm going to address the um, litany of immigration cases that uh, this court has seen, Clark, um, even discussing Padilla, you can't take an affidavit at face value of a defendant saying, I would have gone, or I would have changed it based on X, Y, or Z. Here, reviewing the transcript, reviewing the motion for new trial transcript, the defendant was completely informed of the circumstances, can and we were not under, sorry. Counsel, can we take any guidance from Commonwealth versus Crokin, which was the case regarding the victim witness advocate who was dating um, the defense attorney? Um, I, I, that is somewhat relevant. I think that it's different because we have a judge and a prosecutor here. Um, but reviewing that one was also though not a disclosure to the defendant wasn't it that there right. was that relationship correct and reviewing you know the Lena test um, Gogan was the only case that I found out of um, this court that was applicable in some way there is no um, reason to disclose this information to the defendant he was completely informed the bench trial the waiver the jury trial waiver was clear he said that he consulted with his attorney his attorney was very experienced He's tried over 50 homicides, and the defendant made, based on the facts of this case, the unique facts that it's on an island of 15,000 people where he's charged with subsequent offense of rape, and it had some news, some, you know, it was informed. Judge did not really make a finding as to that. Judge Haley didn't really make a finding as to that, though, did he? He addressed the fact that it was on Martha's Vineyard. No, no, not small. that. No, 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 about whether or not the, the defendant had all of the information that he needed and if he'd had this piece of information, whether it would have made a difference. He didn't, I don't see anything in here about this. He, he did not specifically address that information, no, but he did say that there was. No, he said that the advice that, his, that the client received was fine. He's saying, however, uh, there's nothing in here about whether or not he had everything he needed to know in order to make the decision. Exactly, but he did address that, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, that there was no conflict. I know, but that's not the point. I suggest to this court that the issue is whether or not there was a conflict based on, as a well-informed observer, whether or not somebody looking at the fact that Robert Moriarty was assigned to OUIs and assault and batteries on Nantucket, and this is a superior court rape subsequent offense trial, if that information is going to have a well-informed observer to look at this and think that there's a conflict, that was the issue. Well, can we just tell you today. that, <clears throat> can I just say, speaking for myself, that I don't think the issue is conflict, and I think it would be helpful to me if you would assume that I think the issue is not conflict and talk to me about why you think the lawyer had a right to keep this information from his, from the defendant and having done that, whether or not it was prejudicial. How do, how do we deal with the prejudice issue? I mean, that's, that's really what's going on here. Well, there, there was no prejudice. This court is viewing it as though it's a structural error. I suggest that it's not. And he had no obligation to disclose that information. Also, the defendant knew that Robert Moriarty was an attorney and that Robert Moriarty was the okay. judge's well, son. Uh, well, assume that, <clears throat> that the, assume that the attorney had to disclose that. Assume that we decide that this information is so important to somebody who's gonna waive his right to a jury trial that an attorney who does not disclose that is ineffective on that first prong. So what do you say about the second prong? There's no, there's no prejudice. It's not a, in this set of facts where the attorney was not involved in Martha's Vineyard County cases at all, there's no prejudice. He was not involved in this case factually. He had nothing to do with it. It, just simply because he's employed there, <coughs> and it doesn't create prejudice. And you can't take a defendant's affidavit at face value saying I would have not done this because of X, Y, or Z. Going under back to the conflict, and I'm trying to tell you that at least one of us thinks that conflict is not the issue. And at least two of us do. At and <laughs> at least two of us do. And, um, and, and, and uh, I think what I'll try and get out of the different way if I could. Okay. 
Um, and I apologize if I'm not answering your no, question, well, but viewing it from my perspective. That's well, fine. just assume that you're completely right about the conflict, and just for the sake of argument, assume that you're wrong about the first prong of Safarian. Just, just, just assume it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what does the defendant have to show as it relates to the second prong? He would have to show prejudice. He would have to show that. What, what does that mean? In this context? In this context, that the fact that Robert Moriarty was employed by the DA's office prejudiced my um, jury trial waiver. He would have to make some sort of evidentiary demonstration, which we had a motion for well, trial when hearing. You, when he you say not. that, it prejudiced the jury trial, my jury trial waiver, what does that mean? That he, had he known this information, there would have been prejudice or been an issue in my trial. Did, no, did, he, or there wouldn't have been a waiver. Yes. However, you have to look at that issue, that prejudice analysis, with this set of facts, and the judge having the recusal hearing saying that under Lena, I consulted my um, my ethics, my opinion, I reviewed this case, and I did not find any impropriety. Right, but, but again, that brings us back to the conflict point, which is what we're saying. We don't, we don't want to look at that right now. We want to, to look at this narrow framework of that we, you just articulated, we're going to look at prejudice, and how did that affect the defendant's jury trial waiver, if it did? It's, uh, so you're, but you're with, finished? yeah, I, in, I think I'm finished. In, sorry. Did, didn't Judge Healy address this issue when he said, secondly, the defendant has not shown the counsel's advice deprived him of a substantial ground of defense? Nowhere in the trial transcript did the judge ever demonstrate any signs of bias. Exactly, and that's what I addressed earlier with the fact that the defendant on this island charged with rape, subsequent offense, <clears throat> the only, tact I think it's a tactical decision to go jury way before Judge Moriarty when the victim in this case is mentally handicapped, and if he knocked out the mentally handicapped portion of the indecent assault and battery in a mentally handicapped person, you're changing potential sentence and potential so, penalty. So if we agree with Judge Healy, that's the analysis. We have to look at it globally <coughs> and to see whether or not essentially he got a fair jury wave trial. Yes, and reviewing the transcript in this case from <coughs> the, the bench waiver, the trial transcript, the deposition of the victim, uh, he did <coughs> testify, we introduced his deposition video, and the motion for new trial hearing when Robert Moriarty and Drew Segadelli and Drew testified and explained his reasons why he went jury waiver and take deference to his tactical decision and the motion for new trial's opinion or decision that this was a reasonable decision, then yes, we consider that. And the judge was correct in reviewing the entire record in this case. But you're saying then that the deprivation is not his right to a fair and intelligent decision as to whether to waive his right to a jury trial. You're saying the issue is whether or not he was deprived of his right to a fair trial. Exactly, and the record reflects that he received a fair trial based on all of the facts in this case and his experienced defense attorney. And his decision to go jury waived, again, on an island where you're charged with your subsequent offense of rape with 10,000 people that live there, it was a reasonable tactical decision once the change of venue motion was denied. But I guess the concern I have with that argument is that if somebody were put aside this case, if there was no doubt that somebody did not make it an informed and intelligent and voluntary decision to waive the right to a jury trial, would we say, well, yeah, you didn't, you were deprived of that right, but you did get a fair trial after all, so it's okay. But he, he was not deprived of that right. He made a knowing and intelligent jury waiver after consulting with his attorney as the record reflects in the well, bench trial transcript. Let me try it this way. Um, when we're looking at what's important to the waiver decision, what information is important to the waiver decision, are we looking at it from the perspective of what the defendant would think was important information or what a reasonable would think, a reasonable person would think was important information to have in making a, a waiver decision? It's what the defendant would think and the reasonable person language that you just use is for the conflict issue. That's two separate All right, issues. so it's what the defendant would actually think was important. Right. So if it's what the defendant actually thinks is important, and the defendant says, I think it's really important to know that the judge has a son 
who is a district attorney in the very same county that's prosecuting me. Even it doesn't matter to me whether or not the, the son had anything to do with this case. It matters to me that he's in the office. That would have mattered to me. So it's not a matter of, we're not looking beyond it as to whether or not a reasonable person would think that was important information, uh, whether or not it was an island and you didn't have all other alternatives. We're looking at it as to whether or not, you just said, it's the defendant's own subjective view as to whether or not the information was important. And I don't see findings as to that. There, there were no findings made to that. There were findings made to the ineffective assistance of counsel, the oh, reasonable it. tactical decision to go jury waived on this set of facts. Uh, but as far as your specific question, there were no findings. Right. Are, are, are you right? I mean, I'm trying to think back to Padilla and Clark, but my memory is that the second part of the decision is what a reasonable person mm -hmm. would have done in the position of the defendant. So, because we can never know subjectively what the defendant would have done, but we can arguably know what a reasonable person would have done. It's what a reasonable person would have done as defendant. far as Padilla. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, in answering your question, I meant it's if the defendant can understand the bench trial waiver. That's what I thought that your question was asking. I understand that Padilla and immigration cases, Clark, um, you look at, was the defendant prejudiced? What was the harm? He was deported. Um, here, reviewing the transcript, the defendant had a fair trial, and I think that that it makes, it's distinguishable. Those cases are not necessarily applicable to this scenario. Okay, thank you. Thank you.